All right, this is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today, I have another exciting episode for you. As you guys can see, today I'm harvesting my peppers. End of the season harvested peppers, but this is not a pepper harvesting video. I might have that in another video for you guys about when to harvest your food, you know what I mean? Because we are going to frost soon, and then we're going to have to pull these guys up anyways. But uh, what today's episode is about, actually, it's about pest and bug control. I'm, I know many of you guys have pest problems. Many of you guys may not even be gardening because of the pests. You fear the pests. Like, oh my gosh, I can't grow anything because the bugs going to eat it, right? Don't fear the pests any longer. In this video, we got the organic solution that you can use to take care of the majority of your pest problems. So uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, you know, before you even get the pests, it's important to prevent the pests from happening in the first place. So the number one way to do that, in my opinion, is build good soil. You know, you're as healthy as the foods you eat, right? If you're eating McDonald's, junk food, fast food, processed food, things in packages, bottles and jars, right? You're not going to be as healthy as somebody that's eating a whole foods, you know, diet rich in fruits and vegetables. And our plants are like us. They need to be fed good food. So we don't want to just put, you know, uh, soil down there and then put some chemically made fertilizers and whatnot because the plants aren't going to get everything they need. I encourage you guys to use the biologic organic gardening and farming methods, which includes adding things like bacterial compost, fungal compost, uh, the trace minerals like the rock dust, the C90, applying compost tea, the worm castings, the insect frass, and all the other biologic agents that actually put the bacteria and fungi and other microorganisms into your soil so that they can ensure your plants thrive. Now even in my garden where I have been doing this, I do have some pest pressures. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is how to deal with the pest pressures if you have them. But the goal, number one goal overall is to not get the pest pressures, right? by growing good, healthy crops and building your soil. You know, for example, for us, like if your wife or husband has a flu or the cold, right? They're sleeping right next to you in the bed. They're sharing, you know, utensils with you. Hopefully you're not sharing toothbrushes, but they'll be sick, but you won't. That's because you have immune system. Well, plants are the same way. They have immune systems. So once again, build the soil so that you're, you have healthy plants. They have a stronger immune system and they'll, they'll be able to fend for themselves. Think about it. For, you know, the millions of years, trillions of years, I don't know how many, I wasn't a history major, that the earth has been around, you know, uh, there was no such thing as pesticides, even organic ones. Nobody sprayed anything. The plants literally had to fend for themselves. The difference between then and now, among other things, was the soil. There was a lot better soil, more nutrition in the soil, and the plants were able to have strong immune systems. Nowadays, when you're growing in, you know, imported topsoil, soils that devoid of minerals and the microbiologics in the soil, the plants aren't going to be as healthy. So number one, grow healthy plants so that you won't have to do anything else. The second way I like to control pests is manual control. So, you know, as I've been pulling my peppers, I've seen a couple small uh, snails in here. So the easiest thing is to pull them off, smush them, compost them, get ducks or chickens and feed them to your ducks and chickens. Manual control is always best. The only negative with manual control is if you have acreage, you won't be able to do it. If you have a small four foot by four foot bed, I always encourage you guys to do manual control first before spending any extra money to buy any gadgets or gizmos or sprays to spray your crops. Manual control is the easiest. Hire some neighbor neighborhood kids. Maybe you got some kids, you know, in your household. <laughs> have them find slugs and pay them a nickel. Maybe you have to, might have to pay them more than a nickel. <laughs> pay them a quarter, maybe a dollar. Pay them a dollar for every slug they find and, you know, that'll get them busy. They'll learn about, you know, the importance of hard work and you'll get a slug-free garden. And be like, okay, everyone, you get a dollar, go out and hunt them and they'll sit there all day trying to find them, right? So, mowing healthy plants, manual control. The next way I'd recommend is by using uh, other kind of controls. So, number one, grow healthy plants. Number two, manual control. Oh, another thing that you can do is also exclude the pests. So, if you have heavy pest problems, you know, make hoops and grow with uh, reme fabric, uh, shade cloth or clear plastic over the top of your plants so that the bugs can't get in there to eat your stuff, right? So exclude them. The next way I would do is when I start to spray stuff. So the first spray that I recommend for you guys is to spray only water. Water is natural, it's like the rain. We're not gonna emulate the rain and spray on just droplets, but we're gonna spray on a pressure, pressurized spray at high pressure. I have had videos on this in the past. It's called the Bug Blaster. That's the device I use in my garden when I have mild uh, pest issues to spray them off. So it works good on soft-bodied insects like the aphids and the white flies and whatnot. 
spray them off, and uh, that should be the end of them. Uh, if I have a persistent issue and the other ways that I um, control them don't work or I have a pretty big outbreak, then I'm going to do what you guys are going to learn next. So I've been using this technique myself in my very garden uh, for about a year now, and nothing that I've tested has worked better. And this is super simple, super easy, and anybody could do it. So what we're going to have on today's show is a special guest. We got uh, Josh Cunnings of the Boogie Brew Company. Now formulated the Boogie Brew product because as a grower himself, and he grow he grew lots of California tomatoes, if you know what I mean. He grows some of the best California tomatoes ever, and. The, the fertilizer chemicals got too expensive, so he made up his own natural organic solution. And guess what? Besides growing California tomatoes, that stuff also works on everything. I mean, as the results you can see, I'm it's doing really good. But besides just having good nutrition, you also sometimes you need to control pests because we can't be like, there's no pests, there's no pests, there's no pests, and avoid them because then they're going to take over. So he has a natural organic method to control pests that, you know, that I use in my garden. So I guess without further ado, let's get into Josh's clip and let him share with you how to deal with pests and actually how he's doing it in my very garden to take care of pests for me. And I like that a lot. This is Josh Cunnings, and I'm appearing on behalf of our friend John Kohler here at his own garden in his hometown of Northern California. And as you just saw, his peppers have all been doing really well. His strawberries have been blasting. In fact, 90% of John's garden has been absolutely raging all summer long. Here we are, deep into Indian summer. The garden just keeps on perpetually going. But just like all growers, John has suffered a couple of relatively minor disease pest you know, pest and fungus disease pressure problems. Speaking of one, it's right here behind me, his squash plants, and it's PM. It's called powdery mildew. And right here I took the liberty of plucking one of his particularly afflicted uh, PM squash leaves. And as you can see, it looks like, um, you know, snow has been unceremoniously sort of sprayed, if you will, on his leaves now. This is not a healthy sign. This is a fungus that's attacking his squash leaves. And it's actually quite prevalent here in Sonoma County, which is a coastally influenced region. And also has a big grape republic behind it, a lot of grape monoculture growing. And so that has led to conditions which have allowed PM, powdery mildew, to run rampant amongst the growers here in NorCal. And also, John has been suffering from a bug problem. Uh, pest pressure that's occurring right now in his tree collards. Let's go to the other part of his garden and take a peek at them. Let's touch on the subject of pesticides. If you go into just about any hardware store's pest control aisle, you can smell a noxious odor oozing from the virtual smorgasbord of chemical substances. Amazingly, most people seem to accept this as perfectly normal, without even considering the dangerous effects to our environment. America produces a mind-boggling 5 billion pounds of pesticide products each year alone. That's almost 20 pounds of poison for every man, woman, and child in the United States, annually. Unbelievably, pesticides originated from chemical warfare products. Yes, the same fearsome substances developed by the Nazis and subsequently expanded into our weapons arsenals creating a perfect trickle-down opportunity for the military-industrial complex who could profit from feeding these same poisons back to the entire human population. Just look at Monsanto, creators of that lethal chemical used in the Vietnam War, Agent Orange, and who are now a worldwide pesticide conglomerate. The question is, why? The industry's limits are endless. Is it a runaway train that just can't be stopped? Yet are there any grounds for the existence of these products to begin with? Barely one-tenth of a percent of applied chemicals actually reach their target. The other 99.9% .9 goes straight into our environment. Where does it all end up? 
I'll tell you where it goes. It bioaccumulates up the entire food chain, polluting all of our groundwater and leaving a cancerous footprint in the organs and tissues of each and every one of us. Now here's what you can do about all this. Just like John says, vote against this disgusting and poisonous scam with your dollars. And the good news is that while the false promise of chemical pesticides has become a worldwide tragedy, there are powerful and natural recipes that flat out work against bugs and disease. Today, I'm going to show you how you can easily win any bug battle using my clean, green Dr. Bronner Salsud soap and neem oil recipe. Let's go take a look at John's garden where his famous tree collards have been suffering from a particularly ugly infestation. Through JK's Uber Garden Jungle we go. Uh, past his stricken tree collard greens here and let's go take a peek at what he has over here. Wow, well, <laughs> what do we have here? These look like some seriously infested tree collard greens and just what are these bugs and the resident colony? Who are these little suckers who've been inhabiting John's hapless tree collard leaves? I mean, my God, they've simply gone to town here, I'm afraid. Any of you GYGers who are entomologists out there, we could use some help in identifying these little suckers. They almost look somewhat like orange, over-large ladybugs, definitely some sort of a mealybug or a leaf miner type creature. Oh, man, this is a pretty serious infestation. Well, we're going to win this battle with our favorite old-time pest control recipe, and we're going to keep John's garden free of these nasty critters once and for all. I've yet to find a better all-around pest and disease controlling recipe than the one that I'm about to tell you of. But first of all, you're going to need any type of quart or pint-sized jar that's partly filled with warm water, all right? This part is important, and we'll talk about why you need this item in a minute. Now, these here are the two vital ingredients which make up our Boogie Bug Battling Super Formula. Dr. Bronner's Salsud Soap and cold pressed neem oil. This one's called, appropriately enough, super clean neem. All right, so now, Dr. Bronner's. A lot of you are familiar with their famous line of Castile soaps, which are considered the world's finest quality, containing only the purest of ingredients, with no harsh or caustic agents in their recipe. It's the only allowed soap, for instance, used in places like the Havasupi Indian Reservation, which is a pristine environment located deep in the depths of the Grand Canyon, where the native tribal dwelling residents have insisted that their land be respected and that their soil oil ecosystem remains completely clean, pure, and unpolluted. Now, this is not your more typical Bronner soap, like their popular Castile line of peppermint, almond, or for instance, their lavender body soaps, but it's their high suds formula. It's made for increased detergent power, and you can find this in your local health food stores, dish, and laundry soap section. Now, as is typical with Dr. Bronner's labeling, there is a ton of information on here. It's made basically from some of the clean cleanest soap substances on earth, including coconut fatty acids. Now what I love about this product are its fantastic penetrating, surfactant, and wetting agent capabilities. It is a superb spreader sticker agent and it can be used as a valuable mixing ingredient with a whole host of foliar foods for your plants. The cool thing about Dr. Bronner's is that they give you 1% Canadian fur and Canadian spruce needle oil. These are pure essential oils from fur and spruce and which are added to increase the soap's purifying powers. There's been a lot of research indicating the benefits of pine oil to plants, including a fair degree of bug repellency as well as in aiding nitrogen uptake. But of course, <laughs> our true hero in the boogie bug battle is undoubtedly neem oil. This has become my favorite brand. It's called, appropriately enough, Super Clean Neem. And what makes this particular neem oil so effective is the fact that it's actually obtained from a truly cold-pressed oil, not just expeller-pressed. Now those of you who are familiar with good quality olive oil will know the difference between expeller-pressed and a truly cold-pressed virgin oil. And Clean Neem fulfills its name with its purity and 
quality. Now, let's not forget that in India, where I believe the neem tree actually originates from, throughout history, they've experienced devastating locust infestations, which have been known to wipe out an entire county-wide region of all green plant life. The only plant which is left entirely untouched by these massive locust scourges, where they come through and they consume every piece of green vegetative matter that they can devour, is the neem tree. Now, now that right there indicates to me neem's supreme bug repelling abilities. Now neem is actually great for human health, it's good for the immune system, for infections, viruses and all disorders of the human musculoskeletal system. There's a multitude of benefits from neem and I'm not going to pontificate to you about it all here, but you can go to a website called neemfoundation.org and you can learn more of this truly amazing panacea. All parts of the neem tree, from its bark to the leaves, the fruit and indeed the oil from its seeds, contains beneficial properties. The tree even grows in arid climates, it thrives in poor soils, and it's actually even able to restore depleted soils of lost nutrients. Now believe it or not, a giant chemical and pharmaceutical corporation, I believe it was a company known as W.R. Gracie, they actually tried to patent the neem tree for their own profit-driven usage, and by the 1990s they were defeated in their efforts to monopolize such a valuable natural species by a coalition of farmers from India and environmental activists in Europe who were able to get the International Patent Office to successfully revoke the patent. I mean, how can you earn the exclusive rights to a native tree, right? It's ridiculous and it's highly indicative of the greed which these chemical pesticide companies will go to in order to maintain a stranglehold on the world's entire farming infrastructure. The truth is, neem is highly effective as a natural and potent pesticide pesticide on over 90% of invasive bug species without any long-term adaptation or resistance by the target insects to its multitude of natural compounds. Now keep in mind that this is not the case with those chemical pesticides which the manufacturers have to keep reformulating as they unleash ever stronger compounds in an effort to outpace the bug's own population's abilities with each new generation to build increased resistance to mankind's latest salvo of poisons. Now you talk about an endlessly toxic and deadly cycle which is being maintained by our corporatocracy's grip on world farming and one which is entirely, in my opinion, unnecessary to boot. So, you're going to take these two products, and as I said earlier, it's very important to use a warm jar with water, and these items make up the basic recipe. You're going to take your jar, and you're going to add two tablespoons per gallon of each ingredient to your jar. Now, today, because the weather's warm, the neem oil actually possesses good viscosity. And as you can see, it's flowing pretty easily out of the container. But for those of you in colder climates, or if you've stored your neem in a cooler environment where it can easily solidify in the bottle, it will be necessary for you to place the neem bottle in a bowl of warm water for a few minutes first so that you do have a good flowing, highly viscous substance. So you see how I'm putting the neem into the water there? I'm actually supposed to put the required two tablespoons of oil into the water. This is just for demonstration. And look at that. It's already kind of globulating. All right. As you can see, it won't mix properly. Now, here's where the magic happens. You're going to take your jar. You're going to add in an equal quantity, in this case two tablespoons. Just for the video's sake, I'm going to approximate it. Of Dr. Bronner's Sal Sud Soap. And we're going to start mixing it up a little bit. And I can see already it's starting to form a cloud. Now, we're going to make a neem milk shake. Just shake it. See that? Within seconds, you have a wonderfully emulsified substance, which is going to be far more easily utilized and diffused across the plant tissue foliage, allowing for much better penetration and overall coverage. 
Now, some optional additives that you can elect to use are products like rosemary and clove oils, even essential oils like peppermint, cinnamon, and orange oil, which should all be judiciously applied, of course. And these can be useful in particularly stubborn bug infestations. Rosemary, for instance, is reputed to work extremely well against spider mites, although in my experience, the basic soap and neem recipe has always sufficed for me. Uh, clove oil is also known as one of the only reliable killers of the mites' own eggs, whereas with the neem oil, the reproductive cycle will get disrupted, but it's going to take a few spray applications for that to occur. So it can be helpful to use these other types of products if you really want to destroy the eggs, etc. Now there's quite a few organic pest control products out there with these kinds of oils. This particular one here is made by OAP, Organic Ag Products, and it's called Ridbugs. Now I've gone and added a couple of capfuls of it, for good measure, to the soap and neem base, which I already have here in a pre-mixed jar, so that we can aggressively go after JK's own bug colony here. Now, now today I'm going to show you how I love to use this bug blasting recipe with my favorite ever machine. John's very own commercial atomizing sprayer. This particular unit is called the Hudson Fog. It's very well built. It's made by Hudson, who also happened to make my favorite hose end sprayer, the Chameleon Sprayer. Now, this motorized sprayer is a wickedly handy tool for any serious gardener. I was a grower for years, and I trust this machine implicitly. It just makes the time-consuming job of spraying so much quicker, and it allows for truly complete and total penetration of the plant canopy. Moreover, the atomization of the emulsified neem soap blend renders a true fog particle size delivery, which helps to provide a better diffusion across more surface areas, and it also delivers the beneficial neem compounds in a kinder and, gent and gentler form to the plant leaves stomata or their pores. Indeed, neem is generally regarded as the least clogging of all horticultural oils to leaf stomates. And I personally believe that some of neem's known nutritional benefits to plants, like increased nitrogen utilization, are actually made available to plant tissue when applied this way in concert with the sow suds Teflon-like micronization and delivered in a truly atomized fog molecule. Now how can I say this so confidently to you? Well, when I used to grow and when I was consistent with a neem fogging schedule, my plants were always clearly greener and overall certainly much healthier. It seemed to shine them up nicely as well and pro rose growers have used neem oil for the purpose of beautification for decades, utilizing it as a secret weapon to help them win their rose contests. So when it comes to conducting a serious pest control campaign, you really want to employ the best technology that's available to you. And for me, this machine is simply imperative. Now, combining its use with a supreme recipe like neem and salsud soap makes pest and disease infestations a non-issue. Also, neem appears to bear no harm to bees or beneficial insect populations, like the good bugs who are higher up the food chain who are consuming the leaf munching bugs. Similarly, any neem oil residue that makes its way down to your soil will biodegrade quickly and it will not pose a threat to beneficial soil organisms, thereby aiding your soil in maintaining its critical web of microbial life. Now, always remember to please use a different spray applicator device for compost tea than the unit that you use to apply neem or these other horticultural oils. Now, this is because the delicate microbial microbial populations in your tea will easily become smothered by any leftover soap and oil residues that are in your spray tank. I strongly recommend using a machine like this fogger, or at least a good quality backpack type sprayer for the neem applications, and alternating the spraying with a unit like the chameleon hosen sprayer to shower your whole garden with compost tea in between.
You know, in fact, if you find yourself having to apply the neem more than two times per week because of serious pest or disease pressure, it's a great idea to spray with a compost tea, like for instance our boogie brew, on alternating days. Now this will help in preventing too thick of a waxy oil coating that can build up on the leaf surfaces, and it will also provide your plants with a multitude of the tea benefits as well. The best thing about maintaining a regularly scheduled foliar regime that alternates between compost tea and neem sprays is that you will simply never experience healthier plants and it's extremely cost effective to boot. The key is using great recipes, be that a quality compost tea or, in this case, a natural pesticide and fungicide with agents like neem and the sal sud soap, whilst also employing badass delivery technology like the atomizing Hudson Fogger sprayer. If you do this regularly, your plants can't help but dance. Now let's get down to business and let me show you how, just like Al Pacino said so famously in his movie Scarface, you know, you want to mess with me, you say hello to my little friend, you nasty bugs. So, we're right, so I'm going to add my neem milk's contents to it. This is the jar that I mixed earlier. Now, in this case, the Hudson Fog uses a two gallon base tank, all right? So, I've actually used a total of four tablespoons each of sal suds and neem oil. So, it's a good idea to actually fill the tank with plain water first, like I've done here, and then add the mixture afterwards. All right, because that allows the foam levels to not come up too highly. You want to set the tank base down on a level flat surface where you can easily see the connections and it's very important to attach the motor carefully and always check the entire circumferential area of the metal clamp first. Okay, very important. Now, if it's crooked, then you want to remove it and reattach it in as neutral and solid manner as possible. When in doubt, don't take the chance of spraying and having the unit detach on it itself on you, spilling the contents everywhere. Uh, speaking of which, it's a good idea to wear, to wear work clothes because there's always going to be some spillage. Although I can assure you, the ingredients are, in my humble opinion, relatively benign and totally harmless to human health. Unlike those evil chemical sprays, you certainly don't have to armor yourself in hazmat gear first to defend yourself against deadly poisons. Now, here's how I like to carry the Hudson Fog machine. With the strap on one shoulder only, and the air intake pointing away from my body. What this allows me to do is temporarily pressurize the sprayer by blocking the air intake with my own hand if I need to, which can help when the liquid that's remaining in the sprayer starts to drop down to low levels. Here's a brief demo of what I'm talking about. I've holstered my machine properly, I've checked its connections, I've attached the power cord in a responsible and tangle-free manner, I have the perfect recipe inside which has been properly mixed first, and I'm ready to go and lay waste to those bugs. Say hello to my little friend, you gnarly bugs. Here we come with our clean green meat. really go and lay waste to those evil bugs that have been infesting his tree collared leaves. Say hello to our little clean, clean green, 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 green machine, machine you evil bugs. Bug. going to apply some clean neem magic to John's squash leaves over here, which have suffered a powdery mildew affliction, as we were talking about earlier. The neem oil disrupts the mold spores' hyphal backs, or their structure, and it helps tremendously to prevent reinfection with its supreme natural fungicide qualities. Here we go. Ah! 
Thanks for checking out my Boogie Battle of the Bug episode here on Growing Your Greens. I truly hope this helps to motivate you in maintaining a healthy, pest and disease free garden environment. And more importantly, I urge you all to speak out about the dangers of chemical pesticides. Tell your gardening acquaintances, your neighbors, your family and your friends that there is a healthier and more cost effective method instead. From JK's own Uber Patch right here in NorCal, this is Boogie's message to all growers that there are no excuses for using poisonous warfare products in your gardens. Health is our only wealth, and the planet's future lies in a saner and ultimately more responsible stewardship.